What you say and what you do, does it really matter? I mean, we can talk one way in church. We can talk one way around church people. But tomorrow, we may not be around church people. Wednesday, we may not be around a lot of church people. Saturday, we may not be. What are our actions when some of our closest people in church are not around? Is it unbecoming of God's word? Is our vocabulary out there in the marketplace different than what we would say here? What we say and what we do really, really, really does matter. For some of us, for many people out there, we're the only Bible they'll ever read. We're the only example of Christianity that they know. So what are we saying? How are we preaching that in our own daily walk? Let's read 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, verses 9 through 12. And this is the Apostle Paul talking, writing to Timothy. And this is his first letter. You might remember that he wrote two letters. I said Timothy. I didn't mean that. To the church of Thessalonica, the Thessalonians. Now, about brotherly love, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all the brothers throughout Macedonia, yet we urge you, brothers, to do so more and more. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Listen to this. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. To mind your own business and to work with your hands, just as we told you. So, that your daily life may win the respect of those out there beyond the walls of the church. And so that you will not be dependent on anyone. May God add his blessings to the reading, the proclamation, the understanding of his holy and blessed word. This is a passage we've probably run across many times in our Christian pilgrimage. But I believe what the Apostle Paul is saying here is some very practical truths that we need to not just know and know where it is, but we need to apply it. Now my goal, if you haven't already noticed this, my goal in every sermon that I preach my goal in every Bible study that I ever lead is, first of all, to explain what that passage is saying and then try to encourage you to apply what that passage is saying to your life. But I've always done the same with my own. It's not me pointing my finger out there at you and saying, you better hear this and you better do this. I'm saying it to me too because the Scripture that applies to you also applies to me. So we need to know what God is saying. What he is saying to us today, we need to listen with our ears and our hearts. Now, as I read this passage, and usually any time I, I, I have a passage selected, I read it over and over again. Sometimes I may read it in different translations just to see what else it may be saying not that I buy into every translation, but those that are good and those that are, are, are close to the truth there, okay? But there's two exhortations there. Now somebody might ask, what's an exhortation? Well, let, let me call it uh, some advice. Might even be able to call some of those exhortations warnings. But what are those? We see the first one in verses 9 and 10, and then we see the second one, in verses 11 and 12. And each one describes what the church owes the world. And I started to title it that way. What the church owes the world. Everyone, every one of us ought to be concerned about seeing the church making a greater impact on culture. 
and knowing that doing so will glorify God. And when we read this passage, I see just that. Okay, it's talking here about the example of brotherly love there in verses 9 or 10. And I'm not going to reread that, but if you're following along in the Bible, you might want to do that. The Apostle Paul begins by reminding them, the church of Thessalonica, of their duty to practice brotherly love. Now, the word practice, there is a verb. It's an action verb. We've got to be about practicing brotherly love. Now, about brotherly love, we do not need to write to you. I looked at that and I thought, well, that's a pretty interesting way of putting it. Think about it. You know, he's saying, I don't need to remind you about this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Mm, I find that interesting, his approach there. Now, you may or may not know the word for brotherly love in the Greek is a word that we already know. It's a word that we're already familiar with. And the word is Philadelphia. It's a word that outside the New Testament almost always is used for the love of family members toward each other. Now, the word Philadelphia really comes from two Greek words. Philos, which means Tender affection, fondness, or devotion. It implies to an obligation of love. If we're a family member, I'm obligated to love you, whether I like you or not. And then the second part is Adelphus. If I, if I knew this, I forgot it. But Adelphus literally means one born of the same womb. So, looking at that, then we can certainly see how Christians have adopted this word to describe Christian love. All of us have been born in the same womb, so to speak, in the new birth through Jesus Christ. Everyone who is saved, we're saved the same way. You know, God doesn't have a plan A for salvation, for the, pre for the uh, Protestants, and a plan B for the Catholics, and a plan C for everyone else. John 3.3 3 tells us, you must be born again. And when it says you must be born again, it means that you've got to receive new life through personal faith in Jesus Christ. Let me illustrate it this way. Some of you here have brothers and sisters. You have other siblings. Some of you may have as many as four or five. It's safe to say that you all may differ in personalities. You may differ in your habits. You may differ in your hobbies. You may differ in your likes and your dislikes. Yet there's one thing that binds you together, and that is you come from the same womb. Now, there's a special place in your heart for your brothers and your sisters because there's a bond there. There's a bond that, that distance cannot break. Now, the same truth applies to the spiritual realm. Now, let's look at some facts about this brotherly love. Brotherly love is taught to us by God himself. He gives us the example. Now in verse 9, the word translated taught by God. That phrase right there appears nowhere else in the New Testament. That's the only place in all the Old Test uh, New Testament that that word appears. It speaks not of the lessons learned in a classroom. It's talked about the truths that are learned in relationships. Brotherly love. Now, what's the best way to learn French? Not that I was ever good at French, and whatever I did learn, I don't know now. What's the best way to learn French? Live among the people that speak French. That's the best way to do it, right? And then soon, you'll not only learn it, 
But you'll develop a love for friends. You might even in, uh, enjoy and love cuisine. Cuisine. I have a tough time pronouncing that, okay? And you will come to appreciate the French culture. What I'm saying is the more you're around that, the more you're exposed to that, the more you develop a likeness for that. The atmosphere uh, of, of France itself will sooner or later enter into your bloodstream. I use that example because the same is true regarding love. You want to learn to love? Be around loving people. You want to learn to hate? Be around people that's always hating and backstabbing and backbiting and criticizing other people. That phrase, love is caught and not taught, is really true. We catch that. The more we're around loving people, that becomes a part of our nature. Now, because we come from the same womb spiritually, we share God's basic nature. What's God's basic nature? Love. God is love. Love really ought to be the most natural thing for us as believers. Now, the key word in that whole sentence there to me is ought. Love ought to be the basic nature of every one of us as believers. Brotherly love is at the heart of our faith. And Scripture is teaching it right here. Now, we also see that brotherly love should always be increasing. Okay, now, brotherly love should always be increasing. Do I love more than I did three weeks ago? Do I love others and reach out to others more than, than I used to? You know, if I am today where I was a year ago, then I'm not increasing in that love. It could be because I'm not increasing in my time with God, in my relationship with the Lord, because if God is loving, I spend more time with God, I'm going to spend more time in love and loving others. Verse 6, I believe it says, Yet we urge you, brothers, to do so. More and more. Now, what does it mean to say that our love should increase? It means that we should increase in our sympathy to those in need. Now, I've always told you, as a church, I've always seen you reach out in so many ways to those in those times of bereavement. You reach out in a loving, caring way. That's part of what the Apostle Paul is talking about here. Patience. Patience during those times and situations when people are struggling. Sometimes we don't understand what some people are going through. Until we've been there ourselves. And that allows us to have more patience in what they're going through and what they're experiencing. What about tolerance? Sometimes I just have to pray, Lord, give me, give me more tolerance to deal with this person. Maybe somebody that I don't necessarily agree with on certain issues. Now, the most powerful recommendation to the church is to love one another. And if we love one another, we can carry it out there in the marketplace. I mentioned last week George Barna. I mentioned George Barna a lot. Probably the most reliable church statistics and surveys that we have out there. But George Barna shows that when the unchurched people in America have been surveyed about what they're looking for in a church, the answer is always the same. Now, what do you think that might be? Think about a time when you were unchurched, when you were looking for a church. What was the one thing that, that you were looking for above and beyond anything else? The answer is you're looking for a caring church. You can have a lot of things, but if you don't show 
and express those characteristics of really caring, then I think all else is going to prove very little. Being a friendly church, yes, that's important. Being a relevant church, certainly that's important. And being a church with plenty of programs to offer, we got plenty of programs to offer from the nursery all the way up to the age of adults. We've got programs there. I think that it's important that we clearly teach God's word in preaching and in teaching. And all of that is important. That's good and that's essential. But if we do not touch the heart cry of our own generation, meeting people in their greatest time, in their greatest need, caring, I don't know that all else really matters because we're not going to get them here until we can prove that we really do care. And I'm convinced that when an unchurched person finds that, they're waiting in line at the church. So if you're a caring church, and I believe we are, that doesn't mean that there's not room for improvement. We can always reach out and care more and show more care and more sympathy to those that are out there beyond the walls of the church. And I'd be willing to say that many of you are here now and involved in church when you may not have used to have been, if that's worded rightly, because... Somebody cared in the church, and they reached out. See, this was a primary attraction here for the early church that we see the Apostle Paul talking about. Let me tell you this. Anytime, and some of you heard me say this, I know I've said it on Sunday nights, but I, when I talk about Paul, I almost always refer to him as the Apostle Paul. You know why? I'll tell you exactly why. Remember, several years ago, doing a funeral. I don't remember who the funeral was right now. I don't remember. Say the guy's name was Jim. I made reference to Paul in his writing. After that funeral was over, a guy came up to me and he said, you didn't know that guy too well, did you? His name was Jim. You called him Paul three times. I wasn't talking about, I was talking about the Apostle Paul. So now I see myself always clarifying that, okay? When I use the word Paul today, I'm not talking about some Paul out there, okay? P-A-U-L or P-A-W, okay? I'm talking about the Apostle Paul. And certainly if I'm around people that's unchurched, I don't know who Paul is. So I could see why that guy was thinking I was calling his friend, Jim, Paul. Okay, let's move on, okay? We'll push the release button and move forward, okay? Push the pause button, I mean, and move forward. This was the primary attention here of the early church. Now, you, you got to know that they didn't have fancy programs. They didn't have large churches. They didn't have a fellowship hall. They didn't have all the, the programs. that we, They didn't pass a budget like we passed last Wednesday night for our yearly budget. They didn't have summer camp for the youth. Back then, there was no Cedarmore over there. There was no Ridgecrest. They did not have YouTube, Jesse. They didn't have it back then. Even if you were there back then, Jesse, you probably couldn't have helped them out, okay? And they didn't have the cable that we have. They didn't have all those things that we see essential in helping share and spread the gospel out to others. Yet, Scripture says, it did not stop them. Behold how they loved one another. Now, how does God help us to grow in love for one another? Good question. I think we need to take time to answer that. I think one of the primary ways that God allows us to grow in love for one another is by putting us in situations that forces us to practice brotherly love. Over the years, I've observed God working in a lot of different ways over and over and over again. I've seen this between husbands and wives. There were some issues going on. And they needed to love one another to get through that. 
I've seen that in relationships between parents and children. I've seen that certainly many times among co-workers, neighbors, fellow students, relatives. And the list can go on and on. God allows people, part of our nature, I guess, to have difficulties with each other, often to the point of being angry and bitter. I've seen it many times. He does it because the only way that we can learn to love is by dealing with unloving people. Does that make sense? The only way to really understand love is to have love in action and to express that love Sometimes just saying, I'm sorry, can go a long way. The church is to be a community of love. We owe it to the Lord. And we owe it to each other. I think we owe it to the world. Let brotherly love abound more and more, Paul, the Apostle Paul, said, let Christian sympathy go out to where that need is. Let us take the banner of Christ out there in the world. Let us pray for one another, especially those that we don't like, those that we don't get along with. Are they on your prayer list? Are you? Are they? That's a good question to ask. If I showed you my own personal prayer list... And I'd be pretty skeptical about doing that because you probably wouldn't understand some things that I got there. I pray for people that can be very difficult to deal with and that are not a part of any church because they don't have the Lord in their life. They're bitter. I pray for them. Not because I really want to, but because God's Word demands me to do that. We owe the world that kind of of example. Now there's a second exhortation. There's a second piece of advice. There's a second warning here. And that's a challenge of a balanced life in verses 11 and 12. Now you need to understand, and we talked about this last Sunday night, the church of Thessalonica had a great deal of concern and had a lot of questions about the Lord's return. Now last Sunday night, that's exactly what we talked about, the Lord's return. But the Apostle Paul had taught them about the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the word imminent means at any time. The Apostle Paul was saying he could come back at any time. He could return today. He could return tomorrow. And it's true. It's true now. He could return today. He could return tomorrow. He could return next week, next month. It may be years down the road. But his turn, his Return is imminent, meaning at any given time, like a thief in the night, as we talked about last week, he could come. Now, because of that, there was a lot of excitement, but there was also a lot of extremism. And then I had an illustration that I didn't, didn't bring out in this. I started to. But there's been a number of people over the years that could pinpoint the day of Jesus' return. And they've sold their goods. They've climbed up to a mountain waiting for the Lord's return and it didn't happen and if you study history there's a lot of people that have done that and because of that extremism there uh, the Apostle Paul issues a strong call for a balanced life and this is how he puts it live a quiet life some of us don't know what that's all about live a quiet life See, we're used to our lives being so noisy. We're used to making a splash in the things that we do and the things that we're involved in. We're, we're, we're interested in getting ahead. We don't know too much about living a quiet life. In my daily reading this past week, I came across something that said, you'll never be happy until you learn to enjoy what you already have. Think about that. We think, that if I can just have this, if I can just gain this, if I can just have this, I'll be happy. I'm really convinced that that statement is true. 
If we can't be happy with what we got, don't expect things, don't expect the material to make us any happier. And then another quote that I picked up. Every day above ground is a good day. You know, we live such a hurried life. We are living in a hurried age with very little sense of stillness and rest and relaxation. There's so much motion, but even with so much motion, there can be such little progress. We talk, but we don't know what to say. We listen, but we're really not hearing the words. So if you really think that this generation is unique in and of itself, remember that these words that the Apostle Paul was writing some 2,000 years ago, roughly, these words were written to a city church in a bustling, hurrying, rowdy, large metropolis. The Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul knew what he was talking about here. Even their lives were that way. Many of you have heard me make reference to Peter Marshall. Peter Marshall was a famed chaplain of the Senate, uh, a, a great man. I got several of his books and a, a book that his wife, Catherine, wrote on prayer. Uh, he was there in office and served in that position shortly after World War II. And he's remembered for his pithy prayers. I mean, his to-the-point prayers that weren't very long. But they were right to the point. Here is one that, that he prayed on May the 8th, 1947. And for the record, I was not around then, okay? Some of you might have been. This was just prayer. Our Heavenly Father, help us to do our very best this day and be content with today's troubles so that we should not borrow the troubles of tomorrow. Save us from the sin of worrying, lest stomach ulcers be the badge of our lack of faith. Amen. Maybe just living a quiet life can make a big difference. And then mind your own business. Now, now here's, here's the answer to so much of the problem. Mind your own business. I'm going to ask for a show of hands for those that would confess that they are busy bodies. But if we're not careful, any and all of us can become busy bodies. They feel like it is our calling in life to tend to their own business and yours too. And some of them feel like they do a good job at it. And some of them do. They believe that they have the right to invade your privacy. They, there are people that we really don't come to appreciate. I don't love busybodies. I don't love people talking about, I don't love their actions, I mean, uh, talking about things that they don't have all the information on. And I see this a lot. A lot of times I'll just say, no, I can't say a whole lot about that situation. But let me say this. You don't have all the facts. And if we could walk in somebody else's moccasins, maybe we'd understand things a little differently. Busybodies spend so much time worrying about others that they neglect the needs in their own lives. They become an expert at seeing the grain of dust in someone else's eyes that they don't see the log in their own. And then the Apostle Paul says, work with your own hands. Now, this is the problem of, of idleness. Now, if we're looking for true welfare reform, look no further. Work with your own hands. Now, the Apostle Paul literally did work with his own hands. What was his profession? He was a tent maker. So he would set up that tent or those tents. And in his preaching, going about the, the countryside preaching. Yet he was a highly educated man, but he did not mind 
hard work in the least. Now, to make that even more interesting, historically speaking, the upper class of Rome and Greece despised manual labor. That's why they owned so many slaves. They hated to work with their hands. But then Christianity brought about a whole new ethic here based upon personal responsibility and hard work. Okay, closing things out. Let me ask this question. What does the church owe the world? I've heard people many times, I don't owe the world anything. Do, do we as Christians owe the world something? If we stand back and we look at the first 12 verses in the fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians, we may get our answer. We'll come to see that every one of us as Christians are under the obligation to do certain things. Our first obligation is to, to live a holy life, free from immorality. I'm not saying that we're perfect. We'll never be perfect. But in all of our actions, in all of our deeds, trying our best to live a holy life. And then we see here the encouragement, the admonition to live a harmonious life. If you're always at odds with your fellow man, if you're always at odds with somebody, you can't live a harmonious life. And he's talking about brotherly love here. And then living an honest life. Living quietly, minding your own business, working with your own hands. This is what we owe the world. This is what the world ought to be seeing from us. And if you really want to make an impact on the world, these are the things that we need to be doing. Living a holy life. Having a harmonious relationship with others. And not be afraid to roll up our hands and work and give an honest day's work. Let's pray. My blessing for each of you is this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Well, we're still in January. We're still in a fresh new year. There's a lot of things that go through my mind as I'm driving down the road or I'm in my quiet time and maybe I'm sipping on a cup of coffee early in the morning. Maybe I'm just trying to collect 